Hello everyone, this is Jerry Stone. <clears throat> Sorry for not posting for three weeks. I've been a little busy. Close your eyes! That's part of their fun! <laughs> Inside of this filing cabinet is... <laughs> anyway, one of the students in my video class had a great idea for this week's video. Although a lot of my audience knows how radios work, um, I don't think all of them know. So I am no means an expert on this, but he recommended that I can explain the basic parts of an average um, All-American 5 receiver, and I think that is a fantastical idea. <laughs> so let's get started. The All-American 5 receiver design was um, very, very um, um, commonly used from radios from the late th late 40, late 30s to late 60s, um, or throughout a very large part of the tube radio era. It's a very simple and power efficient design, although um, one significant drawback is that um, it does not have a power transformer, so that means that it, in some cases, it can shock the person if they touch the metal chassis. Some A5 radios um, even transposed into um, printed circuit boards, but a lot didn't. Most of them were point to point. So if you recall, we actually fixed this radio a few videos ago, um, but it's <laughs> apparently have a lot of um, older radios that don't actually follow the classic AA5 design. This one does. So that'll be useful. Alright, here we go. Here's the front view of a standard AA5 radio. Um, a lot, again, a lot of experienced collectors are going to know all this, so feel free to skip this video. Or don't. <laughs> Alright, the first thing to talk about is a lot of these um, chassis were plated with cadmium. Cadmium, that's the yellow dust. It's probably bad for your health, and I probably shouldn't have rubbed it on my finger. Anyway, here's the dial. A lot of these are made out of paper. Some are made out of metal. This basically is just a visual aid for where you're tuning. This is the loudspeaker. Early um, early speakers used a, um, a field coil um, behind um, a voice coil, and later ones used a permanent magnet in place of the field coil and used a higher filter capacitor value. This radio uses a permanent magnet. For more information on speakers, um, check out my Farnsworth BC82 Restoration Part 1 video, where I spent admittedly way too much time talking about um, speakers. Here's our top view. So, I'm just going to go through everything with you here. This is the dial light. This is usually wired in series with the filament string, which is what drives the filaments on the tube. We'll talk how a tube works in just a second. This is the filter, uh, this is the tuning capacitor. This is a variable capacitor that singles out the radio station you want to tune into. Um, for the standard super heterodyne design, I recommend you check out Technology Connections' video on it. He did a wonderful job explaining how our super het radio works, which I could never hope to explain that well. These are the tubes. We'll get to that in a second. This is the aforementioned speaker. This is a output transformer. Um, this is one of the fields I don't know a ton about, but I know it. it I believe it steps down the voltage to run into the speaker. These are IF cans. What they are? They they are coils that. They are tuned coils that the incoming radio signal um, passes through. They kind of work like the tuning cap, but they can be fixed while you tune the dial. These have to be adjusted so that the radio receives optimally. Now here are the tubes. Prior to transistors, tubes were used at the heart of a radio. The first one we're going to talk about is the rectifier. Apologize. I have apologies for the dirt. This is a 35Z5 Z, uh, GT. What this means is it's a 35 volt tube, which is the Z5 correlates to it's a. Uh, I believe it means it's a. Um, ty it's a Type 5 rectifier. I'm not. Again, I know a limited amount about this stuff. 
Um, what this does is this rectifies the alternating current, which, um, as you know, electricity out of the wall cycles 60 times a second, so it goes above and below zero. So to positive 120 volts and negative 120 volts 60 times a second. What this does is that cuts the waveform um, ho um, and holds it at 120. Later solid state... Um, Later solid state devices like diodes and full bridge rectifiers, <laughs> um, they later accomplish the same task. Here's a 12SA7. Twelve SK seven. Whoa, an I triple T tube? Are you kidding? These are expensive. Jeez, I might take this out. And a 12SQ7. These all are multi-plate tubes. Usually these have two or three different plates. Um, these tubes can serve different purposes. Um, I'd have to pull up the schematic. Basically, one of them, um, there, there's a detector. There's an OS. The detector, basically, it's the first tube in line after the antenna and IF cans that detects the radio signal. The oscillator, which in this case it's technically a de-oscillator, it de-oscillates the um, radio signal. Um, and then IF amplifier, which amplifies the signal. First audio, which amplifies the signal. Second audio, which amplifies the signal. And then audio output, which finally amplifies the signal to the point where it can drive a speaker. That this in this case it's a 50L6. Another common design with the All American 5 is that if you count all these filaments up, they will add to 120. Here's another piece of my collection. This is a TIF or 10, but it's the original one. So let's see. The 50L6, that's 50 volts plus 12 volts, 12SA7 um, plus 12 volts, 12SK7 plus 12 volts, 12SQ7 plus 35 volts. That's 121. Wait, what the heck? Must have typed something. Anyway, it should add up um, plus or minus a few volts to 120. So basically, if you string all the tubes in series, you can get away without a power transformer. A power transformer um, sends out individual voltages which can be really nice. It also eliminates the shock hazard because one side of the line cord is actually shunted to ground, which is extra safety. Oh my god. No. Um, but power transformers are expensive, so that's hard to do. Um, these radios could be built relatively cheaply. Here's the underside of the radio. This is where most of the smaller components are. You can see that there's a um, space that all the basically all the components are mounted on top but it translates to components on the bottom we're gonna briefly go over everything this radio has been recapped capacitors are the most failure prone after the line cord which just basically delivers voltage to the radio in a safe and efficient way um, these go bad these crack and these capacitors okay. <laughs> these filters probably still get you though um, and ca the capacitors in this era they're made of paper and you all know what paper from the 1940s is like and you can imagine when you run hundreds of volts through it it doesn't work how it originally was intended to these black and striped components down here these are the filter capacitors um, early solid state all early um, and even later rectification tubes were very crude so they still output a dirty signal there was also some variance in the AC signal with a lot of noise since overhead power lines and bad connections introduced noise into the signal so basically these filter capacitors you were you were running it through a large electrical object that it's basically it you know how you um, try to dampen noise with a large slab of rubber that's kind of what this does, but electrically. A filter capacitor is basically um, one lead, then a ton of paper, and then um, a conductor, usually aluminum foil, and that can that filters out the electrical noise. 
these little red guys, these are, um, oh yeah, and filter capacitors also have a polarity. Um, if you put them in backwards, they can explode, which is very nice, especially in these sets. Um, these are red, non-polarized capacitors. Um, they serve a variety of functions. A lot of these can be coupling capacitors. Um, some of them can be grounding capacitors so that you'll get a smaller shock <laughs> if you touch the chassis while it's on. And yeah, additional components are mica caps. These are actually original to the radio because they don't usually go bad. They're filled with a sheet of mica, which as long as it's kind of sealed and kept out, in the kept out of the environment, they're usually okay. These are usually very, very small values. Um, this is one of the um, detector coils. Um, I believe this is fed in junction with the IF can. If we look, we can actually see the incoming signal is fed onto a terminal strip which goes into the detector coil and goes also into the first IF can. Um, this down here is the volume control right here. This is basically most, except for really early wire, round, wire wound. I knew I was going to mess up saying that. Um, it's it's a carbon track which is resistive, which is a resistive element. So the further it moves along the carbon track, the more resistance it gains from the center post, which um, the carbon tracks can easily fall apart, unfortunately. So yeah, a lot of these are bad. I hope this one doesn't fall apart. And yeah, that's a radio.